Sometimes it is easier to switch off the tap of moral outrage over human rights abuses when they're happening thousands of miles away from home. Maybe that's why it took years before our leaders finally spoke out against this place. But as I stand here comforted by a pledge from US President Barack Obama to shut down Guantanamo, I wonder about the fate of those who are still being held in dark, dank dungeons, hidden away, concealed from the world. I need to share a very dark secret with you, something I should have acted upon much sooner instead of sitting back silently in the belief someone else would step forward. I thought the ghostly figure I conjured up from the darkest recesses of my imagination would go away eventually, but after my trip to Guantanamo, the spectre loomed even larger from the inky blackness. Forty-year-old Moazan Beg knows what it's like to disappear. Very much a victim of George Bush's war on terror, he was snatched in the dead of night from his family home in Islamabad in January 2002 and sold to U.S. intelligence for $5,000. It was not uh, the Pakistani police services entering uh, showing their identification into my house or asking me who I was. It was literally a kidnapped. The only difference was that were, there were Americans present who were dressed as Pakistanis. The British-born father of four was then taken to Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan and eventually ended up in Guantanamo Bay. After three years of detention without charge or trial, Moazambeg was released and returned to the UK. We had spoken many times before, but his revelations about Bagram were the most chilling. Bagram for me meant murder. For me it meant torture. For me it meant hearing the sounds of women screaming that I was led to believe was my wife. For me it meant seeing pictures of my children waved in front of me while I was being hogtied and punched and kicked and tortured and stripped naked. For me it meant watching people having their hands tied above their heads with a hood placed over them and being punched and kicked to the point that they were killed. When Moazam first told me about hearing a woman's screams there, I had my doubts. I believed it was more likely to be part of some CIA psychological torture programme and that the screams were merely those of an actress. You mentioned women screaming, yet I've spoken to a Lieutenant Colonel Mark Wright at the Pentagon and he is emphatic that there are no women in Bagram. Well, I think the important question to ask anybody is what do they do with female prisoners? Because evidently, and what we do know is that in Iraq, they have taken female prisoners and they have also, female prisoners have been abused. In fact, in one of the cases, there is a tangible link between Bagram and Abu Ghraib, and that is one of the, my guardsmen uh, and interrogators um, was first brought up for charges of, of detainee abuse in Bagram. He was rate, later redeployed to Abu Ghraib, where he was brought uh, up for charges of female detainee abuse. In 2002, I heard the sounds of a woman screaming and in the month of May that I was led to believe it was my wife. Other detainees also heard this, uh, these screams and have also said to me that they thought it was my wife because the Americans had always tried to use that as a tool against me. I began reinvestigating his claims and then found credible evidence that a woman was being held by US forces in Afghanistan. I was even given a copy of this interview, recorded by an Arab who had escaped from Bagram in July 2005. He clearly talked of seeing a woman in US custody. The woman had no name, she was just a number, 650. So I began calling her the Grey Lady of Bagram, the spectre I had tried to erase from my conscience. 
This time I could no longer sit back waiting for someone else to act, and so I flew to Pakistan, the starting point of many kidnappings and disappearances. Recruiting the help of Imran Khan, leader of Tariqa Insaf, we held a hundred strong press conference during my whirlwind trip, which lasted less than 30 hours. The Pentagon issued statements saying there was no prisoner 650 and there were no female detainees or enemy combatants as they called them. But by the time I'd returned to London, some amazing developments began to unfold. In a bizarre story which stretched the bounds of credibility, Dr. Afia Siddiqui, a Pakistani who'd gone missing in the city of Karachi five years earlier, emerged in the Afghan province of Ghazni. She was accused of plotting terrorism and was shot in a prison cell while allegedly trying to attack US soldiers. After emergency surgery, she was then flown off to America and charged with attempted murder. Many assumed that Dr. Siddiqui must be my prisoner 650 the Grey Lady of Bagram. We want to know what happened to Atiya Siddiqui from 31st of March 2003 until 17th of July 2008. Enlisting the support from Lord Nazir Ahmed, who asked some pointed questions, the Pentagon capitulated and admitted that Prisoner 650 did exist. It was a major breakthrough, but then they said, she was not Dr. Afia Siddiqui. Although the US officials assured me my search for the Grey Lady of Bagram was concluded, I was not convinced. In fact, far from it. As far as I was concerned, this was just the beginning. And I knew I needed to return to Pakistan once more to ask people for their help in finding the Grey Lady. It is now more than five months since I began my search. However, I'm still no further forward in my original goal, which was to find prisoner 650. Tomorrow, I'll be attending a huge Muslim rally, probably one of the largest in the Muslim world, more than half a million people. And I will be appealing to them to help me find 650. The conference was organised by the popular Pakistani political movement Jamaat Islami. It was their annual get-together with leaders from around the world in attendance. And even though the lights failed, the story of prisoner 650 touched the hearts of the hundreds of thousands that had gathered. Today I am begging each and every one of you, as your sister in Islam, to help me find prisoner 650. If you remain silent, I may never find her. But I'll tell you something now. I can hear her screams. And when you go to bed tonight, you will also hear her screams. Have we all sunk so low that the cries of this sister will remain unanswered? The time has come when the people of Pakistan need to restore the pride of this great country. Already the campaign was beginning to take shape and create ripples with other speakers also demanding justice for prisoner 650 and Dr. Afia Siddiqui. <laughs> Thank you. And it was inspiring, it was forceful, it was revealing.
This was a news actually, mm. this 650, that she is not the 650. A lot of people as assumed naturally that 650 must be Afia Siddiqui. And uh, the information that we've now got from the Americans themselves is that uh, 650 does exist, but she is not Afia Siddiqui. But the Americans refuse to tell us who she is or where she is. Now we need to find out who is 650 and we need to find out just how many other women are being held in secret detention centers uh, by America. Inshallah, you are sister and uh, inshallah we will look after all your needs and all the comforts and also for your security and you are our honor, inshallah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. From Lahore, I was to travel to Pakistan's other major cities, and Jamaat Islami arranged for me to hold conferences to highlight the issue of female prisoners being held by the US. What I'm hoping is that you, once again, will rise to the occasion and find prisoner 650 for me. The Pakistan military has had a big part to play in this shocking, shameful episode. And I would advise those involved and still involved in the disappearance of brothers and sisters to come clean now and reveal the full extent of their complicity. I now want to know where is 650? What is her mental state? Why were they holding on to her in the first place? disappeared, all those prisoners who were locked away in secret dungeons, let's get them all out, return them home and start moving on from this disgraceful episode which has been brought to us by George W. Bush and his war on terror. My campaign was very much up front and in your face, but there were many others working quietly behind the scenes, even in the shadows. Some were searching for Pakistan's disappeared, others were looking for justice, and some were simply looking for the truth. Bob Dwyer, armed security. It looks like a scene from deep inside Baghdad. We're actually outside the Supreme Court, a place where people go for justice, but they're certainly not getting it at the moment. And one such person is Amina Janjawad. M Mrs. Uh, Janjawad, can you tell me what you're doing here and why you can't get in? I can't get in because my husband is detained for last three, more than three years. So he's and one of the I missing was the prisoners. Petitioner. Mm -hmm. I was the petitioner for not just Masood, but for many hundreds of people who are missing like this. Have you any idea where your husband is? Yes, in the detention facility of Army, in the heart of Rawalpindi, which is the area called Chaklala Garrison, in an underground torture cell. If I told you that Dr. Afia Siddiqui is not prisoner 650 and that prisoner 650 is still out there somewhere. Would you be surprised? Yes, but not much because I know there are women inside. I have registered more than five cases of missing women. So it's not something new. I know that there are being abductions of women and even children. And there are other female members also in Bagram. 
Journalist and human rights activist. Well, if you have to mention cage prisoners, that's not me. Stand by. Play. The issue of Pakistan's missing persons has received a substantial amount of media coverage, with many cases stemming from General Pervez Musharraf's rule. In the aftermath of 9-11 and the invasion of Afghanistan, he openly admits in his personal memoirs that millions of dollars were handed over in bounties, from the US in exchange for Al-Qaeda or Taliban suspects. Amina Janjua's husband is one of the disappeared. The plight of these silent prisoners has now become an open secret in Pakistan, and many speculate some have been put on rendition flights, bound for secret locations outside the country where they are denied justice. Okay, now we accept that Pervez Musharraf from a third world country and third world country rulers particularly dictators are very vulnerable and they are weak. But what about those who are buying human beings for $5,000? Is it not reminiscent of the slave trade which used to go on? I mean, somebody should question them. But of course, the US military insists that torture no longer takes place in its detention facilities. We are doing right by these people that we are uh, maintaining in our custody. And I feel very comfortable I can look at myself in the mirror every morning, confident that I am uh, not doing something morally uh, wrong or uh, breaking the law in any way. And you're satisfied that there's no more torture Absolutely. going on? Absolutely, 100%. I will guarantee you that there is no torture going on. I will guarantee you. Stars on the table. But most prisoners are held without charge and human rights groups say they fear that these ghost detainees are often exposed to torture. Bagram, Guantanamo, Diego Garcia are names frequently mentioned, but European countries are also implicated. If you trace Bagram and all the prisoners there, then from Bagram they have been taken onwards to some of the European countries. Some Eastern European countries who have now joined up with the European Union mostly, but some even Western European countries where they have set up the torture camps. There were these rendition flights and rendition. So when you go to a prisoner and trace him that it, he went to or he or she went to Bagram, then you may find that onward he had got to another destination. So many countries of Europe will stand exposed. It will not only be America. But the European countries are not raising the voice. They know that this is wrong. But they are not raising the voice because they are accomplices in this uh, gory drama which has been played out. And the friends and family of Dr. Afia Siddiqui believe she also became a victim of these dark injustices, beginning with her audacious kidnap from the streets of Karachi in March 2003. It was in a taxi like this that Dr. Afia Siddiqui made her journey into the unknown. She had her babe in arms and her other two young children next to her. She said goodbye to her mother, jumped in the metro taxi and headed off. Some people say to the airport, others say to the train station. Either way, she never reached her destination. The car was pulled over in a joint operation by Karachi police and other agencies, including the FBI. Eyewitness accounts say that Afia was pulled screaming from the car, slapped across the face by a female American agent and bundled into the vehicle. The next five years are a mystery. There were initial reports and confirmation from Karachi police and the FBI that Afia Siddiqui had been arrested on terror charges. Then suddenly everything went quiet. Of her three children that went missing, one has now been returned to Pakistan by the Afghan government, but no one knows the fate of the other two.
My campaigning seemed to have paid off and I was told that a senior government civil servant wanted to talk to me on condition that we did not identify him. He said he had been shocked by what he had witnessed over the last few years. I think that what I have come to know through these meetings, the Americans never mentioned about $5,000. They have always talked about hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the lowest amount is $50,000, not $5,000. If the government will demand of them that these people are innocent people, then they may demand the amount they have paid against those prisoners. What, you think the Americans would ask for their money back? Of course. Why not? It's their right. In my opinion, the government, this government is willing to do something for prisoners. I can't say that this government is like previous government, but this government is feeling helpless on certain accounts because those prisoners were sold. One thing. Number two, this government is facing a lot of economic problems. They are still asking for help, seeking help from America and its allies. So they cannot press, even though everyday Americans are coming and bombing Pakistan's territory, killing innocent men and women. This government is feeling that they can't survive without American help. Dr. Afia Siddiqui still insists she was taken to Bagram and held there for five years. The US government disputes this strongly, but it did originally deny ever holding women at Bagram in the first place, a statement it has since retracted. I needed to find a reliable eyewitness and with only a few days left in Pakistan, there was a major breakthrough. This, My uh, star witness was Dr. Gerat Bahir, uh, who had previously uh, served as Afghanistan's ambassador to Pakistan. He was also removed from his home in Pakistan in the middle of the night and held by the US without charge for six years. He was regarded as a high-profile detainee because of his close links with the former Prime Minister of Afghanistan, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. Dr. Bahir was held in several dark sites, but he was eventually taken to Bagram. When I was in Bagram, uh, we used to have one lady uh, prisoner and uh, whose presence in the um, jail was uh, for heartbreaking uh, for all of us. Uh, when she was uh, pushed backward in power by the American soldiers, uh, it was against our culture, against our religion. I couldn't ask her uh, full identity, but uh, she was in solitary confinement. She was uh, my neighbor for a couple of uh, weeks. And uh, she used to be taken to shower, to uh, doctor, to interrogation uh, in public in front of all the detainees. But uh, finally it was understood almost by every detainee that uh, she was uh, losing her mind, she was uh, finally mentally disturbed, she was not acting uh, properly. The Americans said that she was treated humanely and within the spirit of the Geneva Convention. Actually, no one was uh, treated uh, humanly, not only that uh, specific lady. All of us as a um, prisoner, we were not uh, uh, treated uh, humanly. If I go to my experience, I was uh, in a room, they call it a dark prison, and uh, I couldn't see anything for six months. And that room was equipped with uh, three loudspeakers that you um, can't sleep for uh, ever. And uh, I was locked to the wall for almost 24 hours. And I lost 30 cages of my weight in one month. Did you see any more women prisoners in Bagram during your six years there? No, I didn't. But uh, yeah, they have one prison in Bagram, uh, which is uh, uh, open to ICRC. 
uh, where we were there. But in the, just uh, five minutes from that uh, prison, there's another prison uh, basement that is not open to ICRC. People are taken uh, there for interrogation, for torture, and then they are moved to this place. One can uh, suspect that uh, that might be another uh, big number of uh, female uh, prisoners as well. As I bade him farewell, I realized that it was imperative we went to Afghanistan. This was not part of our plan, but the burning desire to get to the truth made it impossible to return to London. Because some other friends are waiting for him as well. They will be joining you. Right. Okay. Most people heading for Afghanistan choose to fly. To go by road is regarded as too dangerous, especially for foreigners. But with time running against us, we had no choice. And it was a decision which nearly cost us our lives. I've toured the length and breadth of Pakistan in my search for prisoners 650 and in many ways I feel I'm no closer to the truth. The journey has been long and hard and the dramatic route through the Khyber Pass treacherous. But now we're in Afghanistan, one of the most dangerous places on earth. Perhaps here I will find the true identity of the Grey Lady of Bagram in the country where I was once all